Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining from. My name is Erin Jordan. I am the Strategic Programs Officer at the International Water Association here in London, United Kingdom. Thank you for joining us today for the um, IWA Earth Observation for Water Management Community of Practice meeting on user experiences in earth observation for water management. So today we have a pretty straightforward agenda. Um, I'll be giving you a welcome and an icebreaker, very short icebreaker. Uh, we have presentations, four presentations from expert speakers moderated by Karen Schenk from EOMAP, a Q&A panel discussion as well, moderated by Karen, a short presentation by Jeff Sawyer about the Sentinel Benefits study later on, and then we wrap up and close. Just a bit of important information. You can use the chat box to just share your comments. You can introduce yourself there as well. And if you would like to ask questions directly to the speakers, then you can raise your hand, come on screen, and ask those questions. This is a meeting as mentioned, so please feel free to um, interact actively. Just a bit of information about the Earth Observation Community of Practice. Um, we started, a, this, this community of practice was launched in 2021, and um, this was part of the Prime Water Project, the recently concluded Prime Water Project. Um, and it is also a part of the IWA Digital Water Program. We also are working in conjunction with Geo Aqua Watch with this community of practice. So, for the COP, we try to provide platforms, much like this meeting, to for like-minded professionals to come to learn to share what they've been doing regarding earth observation for water management. We also try to connect and create inter and intersectoral linkages um, within the water sector, and we try to identify the gaps and how we can address these issues. So, um, just a quick, quick, quick um, icebreaker so we can know where we are joining from today. My colleague Samuela added a link in the chat just now where you can, where we can see where you're joining from. Uh, I see Jeff has already, Jeff has already um, added his name. Thank you, Jeff, <laughs> for your swiftness. I appreciate that. I'm not sure about the rest, but I've managed to add my name. <laughs> yes, don't worry. I can see your name and that's good enough. That's good enough for me. So please feel free to add. Samuela has added, somebody has added in Italy. Good to see you. For those of you who are just joining, we're doing just a short uh, icebreaker just to see where our attendees are joining from today. So the link has been added to the chat. I'm sure you can, I believe if you add, if you join afterwards, you should still be able to see the link. Please feel free to just quickly add your name or where you're joining from. I think we have a good spread. Scenes, Europe and the US. Okay, quite a few people in Europe. <laughs> Just give a few more, few more minutes before we continue with today's session. Mm -hmm. 
All right, I'm not seeing any further additions. So, oh, I think somebody just added. Cedric is joining for Rwanda. Welcome, Cedric. Okay. So thanks for participating in this icebreaker. It's good to see that we have a nice spread of attendees. Um, so as I mentioned today, we are having four presentations and uh, the session will be moderated by Karen Schenk, who is the head of water quality of the water quality department at EOMAP. And the four presentations will be given by Brian Eiler, from the Simpson Center, Sotia Kem from the Mekong River Commission Secretariat, Eels Rus Rosen uh, from Vito Belgium, and she's also representing water, the Water Force um, Water Quality uh, Continuum, and Megan Koffer from the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration and Global Science and Technology um, Inc. So, Karen. Uh, without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen and I'll let you continue. Great. Thanks, Erin. Uh, welcome, everybody. So, yeah, real quick, my name is Karen, Karen Schenk, and I'm working in the field of aquatic remote sensing since now over a decade. I'm leading currently the water quality department at EOMAP, which is a small company specialized in mapping and monitoring. Um, the water environment using all kinds of different Earth observation methods and satellites, drones, airborne. And I will guide you today through the session um, and with great talks um, on showcases how Earth observation in water management brings benefits to the stakeholders. Uh, as Erin already mentioned, this will be followed by a Q&A session. So if you have any questions, just type in the chat and also a panel discussion by our speakers. And we end with a um, presentation on Chov from ERSC about the Sentinel Benefit Study. So let's start. The first talk will be held by Brian Eiler uh, about using SAR imagery for smarter water planning and disaster risk reduction. So currently Brian directs the Southeastern, uh, Southeast Asia program and the Energy, Water and Sustainability program at the Stimson Center located in Washington DC currently. And he's an expert on transboundary boundary issues in the Mekong region and specialized also in China's economic cooperation within Southeast Asia. And yeah, he's a widely recognized leading voice on environmental energy and water security issues along the whole Mekong River Basin. And he also spent more than 15 years living and working in China. So Brian is also a co-lead of the Mekong Dam Monitor, which is a very nice online open source tool. And he's also the winner of this 2021 S3 Special Achievement in GIS Award. And yeah, so he holds also a master's degree from the University of California and uh, in San Diego. And I think I stop and leave Brian the floor. So thanks. Thanks, Karen. Uh, and, and thanks um, to IWA and Aaron for inviting me to speak with you all today. I'm going to share my screen here, um, which actually takes you to our Mekong Dam Monitor, which I'm going to be speaking about, but I'm going to go to the slide deck uh, where we're going to focus on using synthetic aperture radar imagery for smarter water planning and disaster risk reduction. Much of my talk is going to be on the Mekong Basin um, and showing you some derived analysis that comes uh, from SAR imagery um, on reporting um, results and impacts of reservoir operations throughout the Mekong Basin. And we do this on the Mekong Dam Monitor. Um, what you see here on the right is, is one of our pages. It's our virtual gauges page where kind of technical folks can land uh, to learn about the state of water uh, throughout the entirety of the Mekong Basin. And this is important because countries, particularly China and Laos, uh, do not provide information about the operations of their large dams. Uh, China has two of the largest dams in the world uh, on the upstream of the Mekong. Um, they hold about uh, 24, uh, 23 uh, cubic kilometers of active storage um, that can wield 
uh, tremendous uh, impacts all the way down to Cambodia, 2,000 kilometers away. Um, so having information, which we provide via SAR on a weekly basis on the Mekong Dam Monitor, um, provides governments and communities uh, along the course of the river and those who are interested um, with information about the impacts of, of those dams. Um, and it's been a big boon for the region. We launched in 2020. Um, we use a variety of, of Earth observation inputs. I'm going to focus on SAR today, but we do our work with SAR, with optical imagery and microwave um, data inputs as well. Um, over the last two years, we've now been able to make confirmed use cases by the Mekong River Commission. Um, my friend Sotia Kem is here uh, from the Mekong River Commission, and, and we've established a good informal relationship with the Mekong River Commission where we've learned a lot about turning data into information and communicating it to people who need it. Um, we've got use cases in the government of Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, NGOs, and research institutions. We provide an early warning service, particularly looking at China's dams uh, for when those dams release water or restrict water enough to change the river level downstream 50 centimeters or more um, within a 24 hour period. And we've done this 50 times over the last two years. Um, and those alerts hit communities and the people who need it two to five days before those impacts hit, giving them plenty of time to adapt and adjust. Um, we turn our data into information not only on our online platform, but we put it up on social media in seven languages, and that's resulted in 35 million social media hits over the last uh, two years, um, since 2022. Um, our website is there at the bottom, uh, monitor.makeonwater.org, and we get about 15,000 um, viewers per month on the website. So just to uh, give you a, a feel for what synthetic aperture radar can do, it can see water from space. And since, it, since it's not an optical image, it gives us the opportunity to see through clouds as well as look at the earth anytime during the day, um, whether the sun is shining it on it or not. Um, and so what we're seeing is a backscatter image processed on Google Earth Engine of the Xiaowan Dam. It's one of those large dams um, in China. The black is the reservoir. Um, the right image is the Tonle Sap uh, bottleneck, where this is the largest lake in Southeast Asia. We're looking at the part of the lake where the lake turns into a river and begins to flow downstream to Phnom Penh. What we do with our imagery um, is we look for mean values along the course of the reservoirs uh, or, or the river's um, shoreline. Uh, and we take roughly 100 mean values using Google Earth Engine, process that. We filter out some of the shadows and the bias that comes with SAR imagery, um, and we generate a, a mean value for the level of that reservoir. And we translate that mean value into volume, and that allows us to um, know what the current volume is, as well as to track volume changes on a weekly basis. Importantly, we can't do this without optical imagery. So Planet Labs uh, image archive comes into play for a post-check process, and that helps us reduce the error that comes with SAR data from the European Space Agency. I should mention this. This is from the Sentinel-1 um, uh, constellation. Um, reduce error of about five meters to one meter of error through the post-check process. So we really can't do one without the other. Uh, you can't do it all with optical imagery, but together we can get within a very, uh, I think, reasonable margin of error. And what this allows us to do is many things. One, we can just picture uh, and, and provide an image of current inundation in the lower Mekong. And this level of inundation is important um, because it's what drives and makes the Mekong the world's largest inland fishery. Uh, the Mekong is responsible for producing 20% of the world's freshwater fish catch, and much of it comes from that blue that you see um, through the flood pulse or the expansion of the Tonle Sap Lake, the expansion of water in the Mekong Delta every year. We're able to provide a picture of water. We're able to track on a historical basis where that expansion or the flood pulse is compared to past years. So just this year, the flood pulse is just a bit below normal, um, and that's related to both climate impacts and dam impacts upstream. And we're, we know that those dam impacts are impacting the Tonle Sap because we can see them with the data. We can see when those large reservoirs are taking a lot of water from the system during the wet season, and they're going to put it back in during the dry season. We've been able to determine um, 
how these dams operate, 55 of them throughout the entirety of the Mekong throughout the course of the year. And many of the large storage dams operate in a rather predictable way based on the amount of water availability. Now, we don't just provide these graphs like you can see up in the top right corner, but we provide the imagery too for our users. And that helps uh, particularly those who are new to earth observation data or derived products better understand what they're looking at and to you know, provide evidence that they can see with their own eyes. Um, we can piece together our information into cascade analyses which are helpful for dam optimization purposes. This is a cascade analysis of China's upper cascade of 11 dams. You can see those two large dams represented in the lighter blue and the, the red um, and how they fill up during the wet season and then uh, release water during the dry season for hydropower production. China's other nine dams are much smaller um, and they don't show up as much. Um, but this is also useful for drought prediction and, and flood forecasting. Um, so in the, uh, the wet season of 2022, um, about a year ago, we found that China's dams did not fill up as much as they typically do, let's say during uh, the previous two years. Um, and that was a result of a drought that China was having. If you think back to August of last year, you remember those pictures of people in China walking across the Yangtze River or looking like they could because it was so low. Well, that that hit Yunnan province in, in China as well and disabled those reservoirs from filling as much as they normally do. When we saw this in December of last year, we informed communities that releases in the subsequent dry season, which has already passed, but at, this, at that point it hadn't, would be less than normal, less than previous years. So what I've done here is shown that our, our forecast came true. I'm comparing at the bottom um, gauge data that brings in dam releases. So we're taking observed flow from a gauge, finding the dam release in that observed flow and subtracting it out to create the blue value. The blue value gives us an idea of flow without dam releases and how high or how much water would have been in the river under natural conditions. If we compare 2022 dry season to 2023, um, we see that the 2023 dry season, even with dam releases, tracks much more closely to a mean flow line for the river system. Whereas in 2022, look at those March, April, and May, you're doubling and almost tripling flow um, from those dam releases. And this is causing a number of impacts throughout the, the basin, particularly farther downstream in Cambodia, 2,000 kilometers away, the combined impacts of dam releases during the dry season uh, are killing flooded forests uh, in, in uh, northern Cambodia. And this is an important habitat for migratory birds, now many of which are endangered, for fish species, for freshwater dolphins, and, and uh, millions of people who, who rely on these uh, flooded forests um, in northern Cambodia for their livelihoods. Um, these flooded forests are dying out. You can see that in the trees um, in the middle of the river. We're not only able to show what the impacts of, say, China's dams are far downstream, 2,000 kilometers away, but we're able to look at different kind of sections or sub-basins of the river system and demonstrate the impacts of dams all the way down to Stung Trang. Um, and we're finding uh, unique information, such as there's a certain grouping of dams in Laos now that also wield significant impact uh, far downstream. That's represented in the green bars uh, for this Dung Trang dry season chart there at the bottom, artificially raising the level of the river much higher than it should be during the dry season and delivering particular ecological impacts. Just to wrap up, we're taking our toolbox and our knowledge to disaster risk reduction in Nepal by looking at uh, and monitoring and trying to forecast for extreme events um, and debris floods. So this is a SAR analysis of a massive debris flood that happened in the Malamchi Basin in Nepal two years ago. Um, and uh, more, more recently, just a few weeks ago, there was a major disaster in Sikkim, India, related to a glacial lake outburst flood where we were able to bring in some very high resolution SAR imagery, one meter from a private provider, Umbra, and I should have put their logo up here, to see whether the, an avalanche effect caused water to, to rush into this 
um, glacial lake and caused a glacial lake outburst flood, which then destroyed a dam uh, about 40 kilometers downstream, $1.5 billion, uh, 1200 megawatt dam, um, and caused um, um, uh, unknown amount of deaths. Um, uh, something like 40 or 50 um, uh, people were killed in that incident. And the run out of that incident um, ran out about 100 kilometers. So this is a, a new area that we are putting our uh, tech to use and happy to have a discussion with all of you here in a bit. Uh, and thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Brian. Very enlightening also this kind of transboundary uh, analysis from space from an objective point of view. Um, yeah, so we please type your questions into the chat. We will have a look later in the Q&A session. And I would like to introduce now our next speaker, um, who was already mentioned, uh, Dr. Sophia Kem from the Mekong River Commission Secretariat. Um, so Dr. Kem has over 20 years of working experience with international organizations, including the Japanese ODA project, the USAID supported program, also the Mekong River Commission, we just heard, and is recently working with the Regional Flood Trout Management Center of the MRC basis in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. So he holds a PhD degree since 2007 in water resource and environmental engineering from the Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology. And he will talk about today about flood and trout forecasting and warning systems of the Mekong River Commission based on satellite data. So I'm looking forward to the presentation by Sophia. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, I think uh, Karen and Brian uh, have already briefed on my bio and also uh, uh, Brian uh, briefing or detailing about the uh, Mekong River uh, basin connecting to the China to, uh, the upper part of the Mekong uh, region. So here, I just would like to uh, present about the flood and drought forecasting and warning system of the Mekong River Commission based on the satellite data. Yes, next please. Yes, <clears throat> you know, the uh, Mekong River Commission have been formed in uh, 1997 and based on the four member country of Cambodia, Laos, Video, Thailand and Vietnam. And now the main office is located in Vientiane of the La PDO, but remaining the uh, flood, regional flood and drought management center are in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. And we are doing uh, mostly regarding to the flood and drought prediction and forecasting. Yes, thank you. Okay, regarding to the uh, work of the MOC to prediction uh, to predict and focus on the flood and drought for the lower Mekong Basin, we have signed agreement or the MOU between the four member country of Cambodia, Laos, PDO, Thailand, and Vietnam to share their uh, data availability. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, uh, received hydromet data from the four member country about uh, 46 uh, water level and 138 of uh, rainfall uh, station all over the lower Mekong Basin. And because of the uh, limitation of this, some of the area, they have no uh, data uh, provided by the member country. So that's why we try to use the satellite uh, to cover all uh, the lower Mekong Basin. Yes, please. Okay, for the MOC Regional Flood Center, we have um, already mentioned that uh, we are uh, working from Cambodia in Phnom Penh. So we have three main activities. First, we are doing on the daily flood forecasting and flood early warning system that uh, we are doing from uh, June to October. And this month is the end of our forecasting in daily, but we still continue to provide a weekly monitoring uh, uh, water level in dry season starting from November to May. And also we providing a flood, flood guiding system that we have been uh, uh, produced about one hour, three hours, six hours, 24 hours. And 
uh, we issue the bulletin and share to the member country based on our website as well as the sister uh, web page or, 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 or email that have been received uh, from all member country and other stakeholder. And beside the flat flat guidance system, we uh, provide also the drought forecasting or drought, uh, drought, uh, drought, uh, drought prediction in weekly, monthly, and updated based on the NASA uh, satellite data. Yes, next please. Yeah, I I didn't uh, show you what the what type of satellite that they have been used before. You know, uh, since we start the flat uh, forecasting, uh, we are using the uh, hydrogen core model combined with a uh, hydrodynamic model, which is uh, uh, to put in a, a, a few platform. They be call uh, a few platform the uh, 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 flat early warning system. And we use this SOE that uh, satellite uh, rainfall estimated and GFAS, uh, global uh, flood uh, estimated uh, satellite data. So we use those data for our uh, input for flood forecasting. However, at the moment, starting from 2022, we have uh, working and consulting with the ADPC, the Asian Disaster uh, Center. A preparedness center. So we are now trying to use the CHIRP GSF. We have been uh, 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 trying testing at the moment and also GPM uh, based on our uh, available ground station uh, data. So we use GPM use a by co correction. It's a, a by, by us correction. So we call GPM by co. So this is we can use for uh, instead of SOE and GFAS. SOE and GFAS is a product of NOAA, but now we are using a product of uh, uh, from G G uh, GPM and CHAP GSM. So we are now on the testing period that uh, we will try to uh, modify and some other uh, simulation based on the uh, up hydrogen core model and ISIS hydrodynamic model we have applied separately at the uppermost of the uh, mountain area and the plan area, which is uh, mainly applied for the hydrodynamic model. This is uh, just only a schematic how we use the existing tool and the new tool of the platform for our custom activity. Yeah, <laughs> thank please. Yeah, for the river flat custom activity, we produce a daily uh, uh, flat forecasting in in the uh, next five days, and we forecast for the next five days, and day one to day five, and we issue a daily uh, bulletin and share to the member countries, and the member country will uh, connecting to uh, the sub-national level uh, for sharing information to the uh, provincial level as well as the community level. However, come for the the uh, uh, MOC has been done just on for the mainstream uh, flat forecasting uh, uh, activity, not uh, focus on the tributary because the tributary uh, part just part of the mandate for the member country that have been uh, uh, used for the national level, and this is also the uh, our. A bulletin platform we have uh, shared to the member country in every day from uh, to, uh, during the flood season. Yes, thank you. Yeah, for the flood path guidance system, I've already mentioned that uh, we have issued one hour, six, three hours, six hours, 24 hours. So we have uh, captured the, the area of the uh, rainfall and mostly the data we are using from the uh, NOR also, so SOE is a main input for our uh, flat, 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 flat guidance system. And we also produce the average soil moisture and flat, flat guidance system during the 24 hour to uh, detect some of the area which we have been uh, affected by uh, the rainfall. And you know, this year is affected strongly in Cambodia in, in this month. Uh, it has been flooded because of the uh, rainfall, heavy rainfall, and some part of uh, Lao video as well as the uh, Vietnam part. 
Next, please. Yeah, for the drought of testing, as already mentioned, that we are using mostly data from NASA and the drought uh, of testing apply the uh, um, our of drought index of CDI and SRI. So this is the, we apply many uh, some of the uh, main indicator uh, about the drought prediction on the meteorological drought, hydrological drought, and agricultural drought and provide this information to the member country in weekly and monthly uh, uh, information, but not based on the bulletin, but we are sharing information based on our webpage. And you can share, as uh, you can see, our uh, webpage of the MRC that uh, we'll be seeing this uh, flat, flat, flat uh, drought, and it's easy to understand how the uh, drought uh, uh, predicting some of the area in the lower the combustion can be shared to the community level that can be useful for our uh, cropping pattern, uh, planning, and uh, other uh, uh, growing uh, uh, crop, etc. Yes, so now we just mainly uh, describe about what the main activity we have been done at the regional flood and drought management center. But we still have more action plan to do for our uh, activity in this year. Uh, from this year on, for example, we would like to improve the quality of both hydrometer data, water level, and rainfall, as well as the uh, water input. And based on the uh, QA, QC of the water, uh, of the uh, data that have been collected from the member country. Of course, the uh, applying of GPM by co application is still ongoing, and we will produce uh, a report of the evaluation soon after this uh, end of this uh, flood season, comparing to the uh, old uh, model that we have, the old satellite data that we had used. And also, we need some more data, especially for waiting curve that will the member country and of course, <clears throat> the information that have been uh, described by Brian about the uh, reservoir operation or dam operation at upstream is our need for our input for flood protesting. And of course, we plan to provide the flexibility of the flood protesting for the national level at each member country. And also now we are developing the uh, medium and long-term forecasting for flood and drought. And of course, now we are on the testing period, but still not yet uploaded out in our website. So this is that uh, we are working closely with the member country and also with the outside uh, agency like ADPC, as I mentioned, I, DHI as the private uh, consultant and, and e-water from Australia that have uh, been uh, closely working with the MRC. And of course, we are uh, 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 thankfulness for the member country and uh, order outside uh, partner who have been provided assistance for the MRG as a whole. And thank you for, for everyone who are interested for the MRG work. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Sophia. That was very interesting how the combination of satellite data and modeling approaches can lead to an improved drought and flood forecasting. Thanks very much. Um, so the next speaker uh, is Ilz, is Roizen from Vito. So um, Ilz is working uh, for Vito um, as an independent Flemish research organization in the area of clean tech and sustainable development. And he's been working in the remote sensing department since already 2000. So first as a researcher, then as project man manager and coordinator. Um, so her focus was initially on airborne hyperspectral data and APEX, but now it's moving towards um, orientation, the use of Sentinel-2, Proba-V and Sentinel-3 satellites for monitoring of our water resources. We both have been together in a project 10 years ago, the FP7 Inform project, and uh, there are many other projects uh, coming afterwards like the DCS for COP or the Copernicus Global Land Service. Um, it is also a member of the editorial board of the International Journal of Applied Earth Observation and Geoinformation, and she supervises the OFR education activities. 
And um, she's also the contact point of veto for the Copernicus Academy and uh, member of Geo Aqua Watch. Um, just as background is received a, a Master of Science in Physics and a PhD in Physics and uh, from the University of Leuven. And I'm now looking forward to listen to her talk about the potential and, and uptake of Earth's observation for inland water quality monitoring and reporting. Please, Ilz. Thank you, Karin. I will share my screen. Okay. Um, so thank you, Karen, for the introduction, the kind introduction, and uh, thank you, IWA, for the invitation. Um, this presentation is about the potential and the uptake of Earth observation or inland water quality monitoring and reporting, and it is um, based on the AO Mores, another European project uh, white paper, um, and on contributions from um, uh, many other. Uh, partners from the Water Force project, another European project. Um, so it was my pleasure um, to witness at the UN Water Conference in New York this year that the uh, value of satellite uh, data is um, is um, recognized. So, and I cite that uh, remote sensing and satellite imagery holds great potential for transforming how data and information are generated and accessed and used for monitoring and reporting on water bodies, and that field observations will remain essential for ground uh, uh, through. Um, so, in Europe, so with the Copernicus Earth Observation uh, Program and also with its Sat Sentinel satellites and with the new Copernicus Data Space ecosystem. Um, the Copernicus data is openly and freely available. And the nice thing is that there is a guarantee of uh, Sentinel um, until at least 2030. Um, so the um, Sentinel-2 sensor that is often used for water quality is the Sentinel-2. Um, and you will see some examples of this in, in my presentation. So with Sentinel-2, we have a revisit time of five days with the two cent, uh, satellites, and we have 13 spectral bands and the spatial resolution from 10, 20 to 60 meter. Um, so there is complementary value in these optical water quality observations, uh, which are relevant for the European Water Framework Directive with respect to the um, surface water. So, and in this water framework directive, they want to achieve a uh, good ecological status um, and ecological status is um, as, um, is based on, on uh, set three elements, on biological elements, on physical chemical elements and on hydromorphology elements. And for these ecological status, um, there are five classes defined from high uh, quality uh, up to bad quality. So, but we see um, from the Water Force project that there is a need um, to align the in situ and the satellite um, remote sensing data um, to, to achieve the, the highest complementary value of both and also a need to integrate uh, satellite and in situ observations into policy frameworks. But there is good news, uh, as you can see on the right, that this is an, an extract from uh, a proposal for amendment of the um, uh, European directives related to water. Um, and this is citing that um, Earth observation, Copernicus services, um, can be, uh, data can be use so member states that should be allowed to use data of these um, um, services or earth observation. So that's very good news. Um, and in the Monocle project, another European uh, project, the, um, in, a, in a survey, um, the participants were asked which are the um, water quality variables that are most relevant for you. And in blue, we see the um, uh, variables where in situ observations are essential and in green uh, the ones where um, remote sensing can play a role a complementary role so and in green we see chlorophyll uh, temperature and the total suspended matter and then uh, in another uh, in the in the eomores um, european project uh, the there was a publication um, a white paper publication that looked at the um, 
the satellite-based opportunities through a water framework directive lens. And many of the examples I showed today are uh, based on this uh, white paper. And what is in this white paper? There is uh, there was an al analysis of the uh, water framework directive. Um, and on the left side, you see the elements, the biological elements um, that um, are required for the uh, water framework directive reporting. So there is abundance of biomass, there is a frequency of blooms, uh, macrophytes, um, uh, transparency. And then on the right uh, column, uh, you see the satellite derived pro proxies that could be considered to address these, um, these elements. So we see in this right column, we see a chlorophyll, uh, we see trophic state index, uh, phycocyanin, um, uh, area of floating vegetation, aerial cover of floating vegetation. Um, we see also seagrass uh, density, and we see um, turbidity, suspended particulate matter are um, a transpar for transparency and temperature. So, um, so optical satellite observations can be considered in seven uh, biological and physical chemical elements uh, that are mentioned in the Water Framework Directive and major improvements are expected uh, for the frequency of blooms because this requires high spatial and temporal coverage. Uh, this this uh, white paper is accessible on Zenodo, um, and so that's it's publicly available. Um, so then in in uh, Estonia, um, they compared satellite-based chlorophyll with uh, in situ chlorophyll, and then um, the 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 temporal data coverage is ten times higher by using the um, satellite data, and the validation is uh, good uh, on the basis of the water framework directive classes, which you see here in on the right figure, uh, with indicated by these colors. So um, yellow is bad quality, and more purple, bluish is is good quality. Um, and um, and then on the right side, a map of the yeah, this P P ninety percentile um, um, for the summer season, or for the whole yeah the whole uh, season. Uh, then in Finland, they are clearly ahead in using satellite uh, observations for the Water Framework Directive reporting, as they already use satellite products um, in the last two reporting periods, and. Um, they have also a good um, uh, correspondence between the satellite data and the in situ data. They have set up also an, uh, a web-based application uh, called Tarka. Um, um, and um, yeah, I think uh, that's also publicly available. So then um, I go to Italy, where they used um, Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3 data for chlorophyll A. So you see spatial vari var uh, variation variability. And this is used also to select um, new locations for in situ measurements. And you see also the uh, temporal um, uh, changes during the, uh, the season. Uh, and then the satellite base chlorophyll A results compare also uh, well with the in situ total phosphorus, which cannot be measured directly with uh, with satellites. There is a paper on this, um, so I invite you to this one for more details. Uh, and then in Italy, they have been um, producing maps of um, submerged macrophytes um, in the light uh, green, you see the sparse rooted macrophytes, and in dark green, the dense rooted macrophytes, and blue is bare sed sediment. And then you see in the graph on the right uh, the area that is covered by each of these cover classes, and also in yellow, the um, floating macrophytes. So over the uh, season. And uh, France, another example of seagrass mapping, uh, where they have the total area uh, observed uh, rather than uh, average percentage cover in, in quadrats. And then in Ireland, um, illogical, ecological status assessment based on Sentinel-2 was tested for uh, one catchment. And uh, this catchment contains 
44 uh, lakes and ponds, of which um, only three are um, uh, monitored by traditional methods with, with boats and sampling. Uh, and this model was then applied to Sentinel-2 data, and they were able to do predictions of ecological status for 16 lakes. So um, it helped them to monitor lakes, which are currently go unchecked. Um, and um, then um, the Sentinel-2 based ecological status uh, was compared to the, uh, uh, the one based on field measurements, and they found that results were within one uh, ecological class uh, for this test test catchment. And then I go to Flanders, Belgium, uh, where I live. Um, so there we developed for the Flanders Environment Agency the Water Monitor. It's a near real-time service um, based um, um, the Sentinel-2 based uh, near real-time service for chlorophyll A and um, uh, integrated also the in situ chlorophyll A provided by the Flanders Environment Agency. Um, and so you can select an, an, um, a water body on the left, then you uh, you get the chlorophyll map, you can select a date, um, you can watch the time series of the, the Sentinel-2 based chlorophyll for the water body or for another region of interest and also the in situ chlorophyll and then the color code the, uh, um, you see the water framework directive classes uh, and colors which are added also this was a custom uh, customized um, viewer and there is an exceedance alert whenever a um, chlorophyll concentration exceeds an, a certain threshold for a certain uh, class of uh, water body then another example in Belgium, we have at Vito also the Terrasco platform. That's the Belgian, collabor Belgian Copernicus collaborative platform. And there we provide also suspended particulate matter and turbidity for, for, uh, for Belgium and a part of the Netherlands. Um, then in the Netherlands, uh, there is Lake Marken. And there, because of the silt dynamics, the growth of plants and, and mussel population decreased. And they used silt to create uh, Marken Wadden Islands, and um, here you see the Sentinel Landsat um, images and also Sentinel images that can be used to monitor the sediment dynamics, um, the, the spatial variation the and the temporal variation, and also very nicely the building, the creation of these um, um, uh, islands. Um. And then I move from Europe to Vietnam. Um, there is, uh, uh, this is um, uh, Explore VN, that's a, a, a cloud-based Sentinel-2 uh, based platform for water quality for Vietnam that was developed for the Institute of Geography of the Vietnam Academy of Science and Technology. Um, there is a, a, a web application and what is new here and that there is a client system, a credit system that can be used for resource accounting like how many credits have already been used, how many are left, what uh, tiles are already uh, processed. Um, and it's this um, Explore VN will be um, uh, officially hand over to VAST um, in, in about two weeks. Uh, so one of my colleagues is going there to celebrate 30 years of uh, the Institute of Geography in VAST. And then that will be an official handover of this uh, Explore VN tool. And some functionalities, you can choose um, chlorophyll A, suspended total suspended matter, turbidity, trophic state index. Um, you can um, select statistics, the statistical indicators and, and water quality indicators, and then uh, look at the time series of these uh, parameters. Um, you can download a, a region of interest, or you can also, there's some automatic um, processing for a, a number of tiles, um, but you can also do an on-demand processing for, for other tiles. And then I end with um, saying that um, Waterforce um, is working on developing a roadmap for the water component of the uh, Copernicus services. And the draft roadmap was presented uh, a few weeks ago, um, uh, but it is still open for feedback. 
Um, so everybody who wants to get involved and and, and provide feedback on uh, on this roadmap, uh, I invite you to go to the waterforest.eu website. And then here are my contact details. Thanks very much, Ilse, for this, let's say, worldwide coverage of <laughs> showing different kind of products uh, which can be used for the inland water quality monitoring. Uh, we are a little bit behind, but um, I think it's still okay. Um, and then we just quickly move to the next and last speaker before the panel and, and Q&A session. This is Megan Koffer with her talk on leveraging a range of Earth observation satellites for aquatic applications. And um, Megan has a PhD and is a research scientist for the Coast Watch application teams in NOAA, um, Center for application, uh, Satellite Application and Research. And uh, her research focuses on satellite analysis for coastal and also inland water quality, and with a particular focus on monitoring cyanobacteria blooms in inland lakes and reservoirs. She's using freely available satellite data, but also uh, commercial ones, uh, also for mapping seagrass extends along the coast. And she also served as the leader for the Geo Watch Technical Working Group and vice chair of the Geo Watch Early Career Society. So Megan, the floor is yours. So we see Thank your you so screen. much. Yeah, great. Yeah, I am uh, haven't done the, the screen control before. Sorry about that. Um, I was trying to move the, the cameras, but that's okay. I don't need to see the whole slides. But um, yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and for having me here today. Um, again, my name is Megan Kofer. I'm a research scientist at NOAA and Global Science and Technology. Um, and uh, given the audience today, I just wanted to present a few examples of satellite platforms and what types of water quality um, management and monitoring tools we can derive uh, from those different platforms. Um, so, um, as mentioned, I'm part of the NOAA Coast Watch Applications team. Um, so we're a group that sits within uh, NOAA's Center for Satellite Applications and Research. Um, and we have several offices across the United States. Um, we have uh, central operations where we're providing um, help in accessing uh, satellite remote sensing data. Um, we have uh, links and um, data portals for getting data. Um, and then also software development um, to continue to progress tools for being able to access and analyze the imagery. Mm -hmm. um, we also have training and outreach. Uh, so our group does a lot of different workshops, um, both virtual and in person um, for trying to um, increase awareness and um, flexibility and comfort with using the satellite data um, and being able to help users uh, get the, the results that they want out of the satellite uh, products that they're using. Uh, we also have applications and research, which is where I sit. Um, and within this group, um, we use our satellite data products uh, to look at um, different environmental questions, uh, both at the request of stakeholders um, and also um, just through our own curiosity and filling gaps in the literature uh, that we find as we're uh, working with this data. Um, and as I mentioned, we have offices across the US um, and uh, these include both regional uh, node offices and then also offices that are focused on uh, more specific uh, applications such as our Polar Watch Group and our Water Watch Group. Uh, and today I'll be sharing um, just from a few satellites that I've used uh, pretty heavily in water quality uh, monitoring. Uh, and these can be split into two broad groups, uh, the first being commercial high spatial resolution satellite platforms. Um, so uh, these include uh, Maxar's Worldview 2 and Worldview 3 satellite platforms, each of which have a spatial resolution of two meters, um, which is uh, extremely fine spatial resolution and is really useful for mapping small scale heterogeneous features. And then also the planet scope satellites from Planet Labs, uh, which have a spatial resolution of five meters. Um, and each of these um, platforms have different trade-offs as far as how uh, frequently they're revisiting a spot, um, how much data they're collecting across the electromagnetic spectrum and things like that. Um, and with these platforms, uh, typically you do have to pay for access to the imagery um, because we're federal government here in the US, we do get access to these um, at no cost to us. Uh, so it's been really helpful for us to be able to develop um, processing protocols, especially over aquatic environments, because many of these sensors are designed for land, not for water. Um, so understanding uh, some of those kind of data quality nuances um, and uh, trying to make improvements for uh, commercial sensors moving forward specific to aquatic applications 
has been a focus of our research um, with uh, that ability to access the data as well. And then the other group of satellites um, are, are most likely more common to you. Uh, these are the freely available and open access satellite platforms. Uh, and this includes Landsat 8, um, which as it says in the name is also typically a land sensor, um, but has really high uh, quality data and has been used a lot for uh, water quality. Um, and Landsat 8 is part of this longer Landsat legacy um, that has uh, decades of satellite data observations. Um, one of the studies that I'll present on in a few slides, we were able to look at 40 years of um, change in a certain location using the Landsat legacy. Um, and then we also have Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-3, um, and they have, um, they're have they off by just a number, but off quite a bit in spatial scale and other characteristics as well. So they have um, really unique advantages in different uh, water quality uh, monitoring scenarios. Sentinel-2 offers um, between 10 and 60 uh, meter spatial resolution, but most of the spectral bands that I use in my research are 20 meter spatial resolution. And then Sentinel-3 is quite a bit coarser, um, but has other advantages uh, with a spatial resolution of 300 meters. Uh, first, I'll show a few studies I've done with some of the commercial data um, and products that we can derive uh, using this. Uh, the first is seagrass mapping. Um, so uh, that's been a big part of my research so far. Uh, we're able to use this high spatial resolution data um, to map the really fine scale features of seagrass and be able to differentiate um, relatively small seagrass patches from nearby sand and rocks um, and corals and things like that. Um, and with the Worldview 2 and 3 data, um, this is showing just a single example at Back Sound, which is located in North Carolina in the United States. Um, and in the top row uh, is a Worldview 2 image with uh, field data overlaid in shades of orange, um, indicating both patchy and continuous seagrass beds. Uh, and in the bottom row is our Worldview 2 image classification, which we use a uh, machine learning classifier to be able to separate pixels into seagrass and other classes. And uh, as part of this project, um, we developed the first reproducible and semi-automated workflow for being able to use the Maxar Worldview 2 and 3 data uh, for aquatic applications. Um, again, this was typically designed for land and there were some data quality issues over aquatic targets, um, but we were able to uh, produce a usable product for being able to get um, uh, categorical uh, variables such as seagrass presence and absence out of the uh, commercial data. Um, and in our current efforts, we're also looking at expanding this. Um, uh, on the left here is um, a, a map looking at the United States where uh, I'm showing some of the areas we've been, um, meaning areas that we have successfully mapped, um, done statistical comparisons with field data and feel confident about our uh, results that we're presenting for these areas. Um, and all in the United States, but they represent a, a broad range of optical water types, uh, climate conditions, uh, seagrass species, and that includes all the way from Alaska down to California, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, as well as the United States East Coast and New England. Um, and then here on the right is a map um, centered over the Indo-Pacific looking at where we're going. Um, so these are some of the sites uh, that we've been working on classifying currently, including Hawaii, Indonesia, uh, the Philippines, and Western Australia. Um, the Indonesia and Philippines partnerships have been particularly um, prominent for us recently um, as they're hoping to generate country scale maps of uh, blue carbon storage um, that's uh, currently being held in seagrass ecosystems. Um, so those are some of our, our current efforts within the, the NOAA Coast Watch group. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, carbon storage is something that we can um, get at with the satellite data. Um, this is slightly less refined than our seagrass classification approach. Um, we're still a bit in the development phase here, just because it can differ so much based on location. Um, and it's also really different generating uh, categorical versus continuous uh, data products. Uh, we typically have um, uh, slightly higher requirements for accuracy when we're looking at continuous data uh, versus when it can be kind of lumped into different categories. Um, so currently we're looking at using the commercial um, earth observing platforms um, to look at uh, carbon storage based on our seagrass classification maps. And this is showing just a single example at St. Joseph Bay in Florida, also in the US. Or on the left is our classification of seagrass presence and absence. And then on the right, we were able to use um, one of the spectral bands on the Worldview 2 sensor uh, to estimate how much carbon storage was stored in um, the seagrass ecosystem. 
And for 2010, we estimated that seagrasses in this bay um, held uh, about 1,600 metric tons of carbon, which is equivalent to carbon dioxide emissions generated from 4 million gallons of gasoline. Um, so again, this is slightly less refined, and we haven't tested this at um, many other sites aside from here. Another limiting factor is getting field data um, for us to be able to uh, validate the results that we're generating from the satellite products. Um, so something that we're working on and hoping to have a better idea of uh, moving forward. And then next, I'll uh, show some of the applications with our freely available and open access satellite platforms, including uh, the Landsat Legacy and the Sentinel 2 and 3 satellite series. Um, so uh, recently, um, we've looked at, uh, this is uh, an image of Cape Cod um, in uh, Massachusetts in the United States. We've been able to look at water clarity uh, for um, about uh, 200 ponds across the Cape. Um, so the Cape is extremely susceptible to water quality changes um, and has itself almost a thousand ponds across the across um, just this relatively small area. Um, and we were able to use the Landsat data uh, dating back um, about 40 years to be able to look at changes in water clarity, which can be really important for understanding uh, kind of baseline trends over time and also um, for targeting um, management approaches and increased field sampling uh, for future um, field sampling efforts across the Cape. Um, so for the most part, we found that Cape Cod ponds that we studied were improving in, in long-term water clarity, um, which is likely the result of uh, several management practices that have been in place for several decades across this area. Um, and only a few ponds were deteriorating in water clarity across these 40 years, uh, but those are particularly important moving forward um, for research prioritization. Uh, we can also look at cyanobacterial blooms. Um, so this is um, an image I generated that shows each of the states across the U.S. Um, where each state is represented by a hexagon, just so that they're consistent in size. Um, and each one of these hexagons is also a pie chart that shows the percentage of water surface area that it was experiencing cyanobacterial blooms for the year 2019. Um, and this can be really helpful for us understanding national scale patterns um, uh, across space and time. Um, so this is just showing a single year, but we're able to generate uh, these maps from 2016 to 2023 um, and plan to continue doing this moving forward. Um, and this analysis is based on over 2000 lakes across the US. Um, so even though Sentinel-3, um, which is the, the satellite we were using um, to generate this product, uh, Sentinel-3 has a spatial resolution of 300 meters, but there's still thousands of lakes across the country that we're able to observe with that spatial resolution. Um, and with this, we can identify states that have um, relatively higher temporal frequency of cyanobacterial blooms, um, including Maryland, Florida, and Oregon. Uh, some of these are well known to have frequent cyanobacterial blooms, um, such as Florida and Oregon, um, but others, including Maryland and North Carolina, um, were uh, relatively surprising. And then looking at the state, state scales results, uh, we can see which ponds um, are experiencing frequent cyanobacterial blooms contributing to these higher state scale averages. Um, we can also look at um, Sentinel-2. Uh, so uh, with the Sentinel-3 work, um, we've been able to take that product to operational use. Um, where we're generating uh, Sentinel-3 cyanobacteria uh, measurements um, on a daily basis and releasing that to the public. And it's used by many states for decision-making and resource prioritization. Um, but the question we keep getting asked is for finer spatial resolution data. Uh, so the finer spatial resolution data uh, has a couple benefits. First of all, we're able to look at more lakes. So instead of 2,000 lakes, um, which we can observe with Sentinel-3, uh, we have over 150,000 lakes and reservoirs across the U.S. that we can observe with Sentinel-3, um, and that's a pretty conservative estimate. Um, it's likely many more than that uh, that we're able to look at. But additionally, we're able to see um, more of the shoreline and also more of the narrow reaches of lakes with finer resolution data. Um, so this lake here on the left is Lake Anna in Virginia in the U.S., um, and the product that's being shown is the maximum chlorophyll index, uh, which is giving us an idea of how much chlorophyll is in the water column. And with Sentinel-3, we are able to observe this lake, but we're only able to look at the more central and larger portions of the lake. And we're not getting any information on um, these narrow arms and reaches of the lake, uh, nor of the uh, area closer to the shoreline 
Um, and both of these areas can be um, problem areas where cyanobacterial blooms or algal blooms more generally tend to accumulate. Uh, so um, this additional product is really useful for being able to um, collect more information about blooms um, at more lakes and within lakes that were observable previously. Um, and I just wanted to leave you all with this, um, which is um, just kind of the capabilities of the NOAA Coast Watch team, um, where we're able to uh, provide um, streamlined source for users to access and interpret satellite data. Um, so uh, just uh, looking up NOAA Coast Watch can um, get you a lot of information, and there's also a lot of training courses that are offered uh, that can be really helpful for um, helping users understand um, the data that they're um, uh, getting and also um, how to generate their own products for their own areas uh, moving forward. Um, and we look at both coast or not both, but we look at coastal, inland, and also ocean applications. Um, so we're across a large gradient of um, uh, water quality uh, uh, observations. And we also have um, a really large group with a lot of different expertise. Um, so uh, a great group and a great resource for uh, accessing Earth observation data. Great, great, thanks. Thanks, Mac, and that was very impressive what you all do with the different kinds of satellite systems in uh, in your work. Um, so yeah, I look at the time we have overspent a little bit, but anyway, I would like to thank all the speakers for explaining all the background and also showing some real world application of the satellite data in the field of water management. So we now move to the Q&A session and the panel discussion and um, we have one question from the audience, so from, from Joff to uh, Brian directly. So first of all, of course, he thanks you. And then he asks, could you please exp expand a bit on what actions and decisions are being taken as a result for the better understanding of the water levels and flows? Great, thanks, Jeff. Great question. Um, well, a few impacts. Uh, one, the, the, the biggest impact is um, our goal is to have China particularly, uh, but also all countries of the Mekong to share their dam operations data in near real time. Um, so we think with uh, more transparency, more light shining on these reservoirs, more socialization of the data, it becomes normalized and, um, and much more acceptable and less controversial to share that data. And to date, it has been very uh, controversial to, to share data, um, particularly uh, from China even though the downstream countries have asked for it for decades. Um, so in September, um, uh, the Mekong River Commission, and perhaps Sotia can speak more to this, uh, had a meeting in Beijing with their counterpart organization there, the Lantang Mekong Cooperation Mechanism, where the result of that meeting was a pledge to share dam operations data by the end of the year. Um, and uh, we haven't heard any details I'm not sure if any details are known other than a pledge, um, but we're you know we're, we're patiently waiting for that day when the data is shared, and then we'll think about what what we do and what our role is in this. So that's been I, I think that will be the the greatest impact. Um, but uh, others are um, China has uh, increased its data sharing for river gauges um, as a result of our early warning efforts um, to hourly reporting, not just once a day, but now twice a day. Um, and that's important for, uh, again, providing um, uh, enough time for downstreams to adapt, downstream uh, communities to adapt to changes around them. Um, the, the Mekong River Commission has published our data in a study on low flows. Um, and now it's become part of the official discourse that both dam impacts and climate change are impacting the, the flood pulse or the monsoon effect of the Mekong um, and, uh, or of the river system. So dam impacts during the wet season are bringing the river level down. Climate change is bringing less water into the system as well. Um, and uh, so that, that now is part of the official discourse and we think we've played a role in that. Um, but just to provide a, a criticism, um, I think that's true of the, the wet season. But in the dry season, um, those increased river levels that we're seeing throughout the basin as a result of dam releases, those aren't related to climate change. That's just that's entirely driven by 
by dam releases. Um, and it's having a major effect on local ecologies and communities. And we're gonna be shifting our efforts to trying to impact the discourse um, and planning on, on this area, particularly because Cambodia is now committed to conserving and preserving those flooded forests, even as they are dying. And that can't be done without greater transboundary cooperation. Great, great. Thanks, thanks, Brian, for uh, elaborating on this. Uh, maybe Sophia from, from Cambodia, you have anything to add here? Um, I don't know what actions are taking, for example, for the currently existing um, high flood season in Cambodia. Maybe you can say a few words here. Yeah, I think uh, Brian had already mentioned concern about the uh, data sharing information, especially from the upper part of the country of the Mekong River, especially from China, but uh, not only concern from China, but also now the lower Mekong Basin, especially from Laos, Cambodia, uh, Thailand, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Also concerned about the uh, many uh, hydropower dams have been constructed in the uh, tributary as well as the mainstream, especially in Laos. Now we have proposed for three that up a new uh, dam, one more dam that is uh, concerned in the future of not natural flow anymore, but have the uh, concern about the uh, hydropower dam pack for the uh, River of the Mekong. Thank you. Thank you, Susia. Um, let me see if, if there are more questions. I have another question um, to Ilts. Um, so we have seen a few examples you showed very nicely from different countries where Earth observation-based water quality products are finding its way to monitoring and reporting. So what are, to your opinion, the greatest barriers to start using these EO-based projects uh, in real world? Um, yes, this is, um, so during one of the Water Force webinars, um, we organized um, an, uh, a, a survey um, and according, so we were asking the participants about uh, what their opinion was uh, related to this. So, um, so according the, to the according to the participants, the largest barriers uh, that they recognized were coming from the uh, missing legal framework, um, missing technical skills, uh, then limited trust, and um, not aware of satellite observations. So with respect to the legal framework, uh, so as I, as I presented in Europe, uh, crucial steps are already taken to include uh, Copernicus and remote sensing in, uh, in future directives. Um, so, and with respect to the technical skills, I think more capacity building and um, hands-on training is required. Um, not only access to data, but also access to tools um yeah and one example is the, the telescope the, the belgian platform that i showed where you can access data and, and products um but also tools like uh, users can ask for a virtual machine their example Jupyter notebooks uh, they can build their own workflows with open eo uh, which is an, an esa initiative but which will also be implemented in the future uh, Copernicus data space ecosystem, the new uh, Copernicus platform. Um, so there are steps already taken. Then um, with respect to uh, limited trust, uh, I think that um, is work or R&D efforts are needed to um, provide uncertainty um, measures. Um, and with with the satellite based products, and also there is a need for more uh, in situ data um, for validation of the satellite based uh, products, and and also in situ data covering um, different optical water types, different uh, geographical regions, and then with the respect to to um, uh, raising the awareness, I think initiatives like what the, IW, the IWA is doing right now here, uh, which is very much appreciated, but also the UNESCO or the, or the not UNESCO, the UNEP uh, World Water Quality Alliance is doing, Geo Aqua Watch is doing. So these are all great, uh, great initiatives that uh, um, will um, help us um, overcome uh, these barriers. So. 
Great, and that, that was a great summary, <laughs> which I can only yeah, acknowledge and, and um, support here. Um, so we have another question for to Megan. So to your um, presentation, so what trade-offs do you consider when deciding whether to use a commercial or freely available satellite platform? Yeah, um, so our preference is always the freely available just because it's so much easier for stakeholders and partners to be able to access the imagery. Um, and for the most part, um, those are the operational products that we're defining. Um, but with some scenarios and um, some um, ecosystems that we're monitoring, uh, the coarser spatial resolution of the freely available satellites just isn't sufficient for what we're trying to do. Um, and um, as you saw, one of the biggest examples of that is with our, our seagrass work. So the seagrass beds are um, just so small that even some of them aren't captured in the two meter data. And um, so to be able to try and use kind of 10 or even higher resolution um, data, um, it's certainly been done in um, larger and more dense seagrass beds, but to be able to capture uh, so the, some of the smaller heterogeneous areas and really capture the edge of seagrass beds, um, we have to use some of the finer uh, scale data. And then even within that, um, looking at the temporal resolution is also really important. So with the freely available data um, that's collected continuously and um, consistently um, over time, but with, uh, for example, with the Maxar Worldview 2 and 3 platforms, those um, are what are referred to as point and shoot sensors, meaning that data is not collected continuously. And that's because um, of data storage and transmission limitations. Um, so uh, we kind of have to hope that there's an image where we want it in the archive, or we have to task the satellite for a future image. Um, and so there's not kind of this consistent um, retrospective uh, data set for us to be able to look at over time. Um, and with seagrass beds, generally they're slower changing than things such as cyanobacterial blooms in the water column. So it's not as much of an issue, um, but these are the different things that we have to weigh um, in uh, trying to decide which of the platforms we want to use. Um, and always uh, stakeholder use is in mind and at the forefront of our decision-making. Um, but in some scenario, in some situations, it's just not feasible for us to be able to use coarser resolution and free data. So we have to find other avenues uh, for accessing uh, finer spatial resolution commercial products. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Uh, I also think that we need to have like this, yeah, the whole picture we can only um, serve with different kinds of satellite systems. We also can use the SAR or the optical data to supporting the water environment monitoring. Um, yeah, so very interesting. Um, I think we we can close, let's say, this question answer session. Thanks for all the valuable insights. And if there are any further questions, just get in touch with one of us to the speakers. I think you have um, all the email addresses in the presentations or just contact IWA in case you don't reach out to anybody of us. So then we can move to the final um, topic of our agenda today, which is a presentation by Jeff Sawyer from ERSC. So he will present today about the Sentinel Benefit Study Short SEPs, which I can warmly recommend because we have in part in, uh, in one of the reports dealing with the water quality management here in Germany. Uh, and it's supporting us really in highlighting the benefits of using the Earth observation data. So really appreciated this. And just a short words to Joff. So during his long and varied career, uh, Joff has held senior management positions in the space industry like Astrium, EADS or Airbus, as well as numerous representative positions in the UK and also in Europe. And he was previously a director of ERSC for over 12 years, and he has now served on many EU consultancies and industry representative groups. Um, he also spent three years working for the European Commission, where he was responsible for supporting space policy and also, in particular, the creation of the GMS, now Copernicus initiative we all benefit now from. So please, Chof, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. You, you hear me OK? Good. OK. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity just to uh, present a little bit on what we're doing uh, today. Um, I'm, uh, as Karen has said, I was the uh, Secretary General of ERSC, and uh, as ERSC, we developed this um, uh, project with the European Space Agency and indirectly the European Commission called SEBS, 
which is looking at the benefits of the data coming from the Sentinel satellites. And my introduction here is always, well, there are always um, these big cost benefit analyses, which are very much top down analyses. And the politicians bought those arguments, but I would not have done. I'm very glad they did buy them. But uh, um, so we talked about doing a bottom up where we look at the value created by a single product or service. And we look along a value chain uh, in order to uh, to evaluate what's going on and to understand how that's benefiting the users, the um, secondary uh, users and society. And as part of that, we've done now 25 plus cases. Um, we've moved beyond just looking at economics. I'll explain a little bit more. Everyone's interested in the numbers, but um, I think we had a, an excellent example just now of the, um, the benefits which are not economic. And we found in many cases, the ability to have a wide synoptic view from satellite data um, leads to data sharing, leads to uh, breaking down barriers between organizations and the creation of new platforms. And um, as Brian explained just now, that's you know, very much an objective of the work they're, they're doing. And uh, as part of this, we've done some cases on water quality management, and I just wanted to highlight one or two of those uh, today. So there is the uh, sort of a, a picture of the different cases that we've been done, um, almost all in Europe, one or two outside. We are interested in Europe. And one of the reasons I wanted to be here today was to explain about uh, the possibility of new cases and if people have cases uh, that we could look at. So there are two pillars to our work. One is the uh, value chain. So clearly we start off with the service provider. Um, then we have a primary user. And this is the key actor in this because um, what they are doing is fundamental to be exploiting the, the service that's, um, that's being uh, generated and being used. Um, and one of our conditions is that this is in uh, operational, so that there is an understanding of what's going on and how the data is being used and how downstream further organizations are benefiting from the work the primary user is doing, and then citizen society are benefiting as, as well. So this is uh, one of the value. This is the the example of the value chain. Um, then we found out that um, although everyone, as I said, is interested in the numbers, uh, there are soft benefits, which in some cases are maybe even more important than the the economic benefits. So we define this methodology where we have six dimensions of value. So the first one is the economic which is basically those that can be monetized where we can put a number on it. And then environmental benefits, regulatory benefits, innovation and creation, new business entrepreneurship or changing organizations, uh, advancements in science and technology research, and then the societal benefits. So now what we do is we take each of those tiers in turn and we try to understand what's going on and, and allocate or understand benefits in relation to each of these six dimensions. So I mentioned we've done a number of cases linked to water quality. Uh, the first one was in um, in Germany, in Baden-Württemberg. And here, in fact, uh, Karen's company, EOMAP, is the uh, service provider, and we worked with EOMAP in, in doing this. Um, and the second case was in uh, Finland, which um, Ilse mentioned earlier, and the Tarka service, uh, which has been put in place. So in each of those, and um, monitoring lakes, uh, but as I think most people here would appreciate, um, the l wide area coverage of the satellite data um, enables much many more lakes to be monitored, even if the in situ data is not replicable. replicable. So um, this is complementary to in situ data. Um, in Germany, the uh, the budget allows monitoring of about 15 out of 270 lakes. This is in Baden-Württemberg, sorry, not in Germany. And in um, in Finland, there are so many thousands of lakes, and uh, only a few of those are monitored using in situ analysis. So you're replacing the precision of the measurement with a much much more frequent measurement and over a much wider scale. So in Germany, um, we looked at this and we were puzzled why the agency, the environmental agency was using 
uh, the satellite data when it wasn't helping them in their daily work. As Ilse has mentioned, the Water Framework Directive did not recognize the use of satellite data. And whilst Finland have adopted its use based on their expert uh, experience, uh, in Germany, they follow very much the regulation, but they were still doing this work anyway. And the result we um, identified was that it, because it benefits the agency itself. So they're willing to put budget to this monitoring, um, to the benefit of the agency and keeping the citizens more uh, accurately, um, better informed. In Finland, uh, the problem is much greater. There are many more, uh, many more lakes and uh, um, inland waters. Um, so uh, get the uh, the benefit um, is higher. It's being used in the reporting of the Water Framework Directorate. So here, along the bottom, you see the uh, the benefit in monetary terms, and also our assessed scale of the benefit in each of the other dimensions. Now. We'll shortly be publishing a third case on this um, from the, the Netherlands. But what we've gone on to, 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 to do is to look across the cases. So the fact that we've got three cases and we've got other cases which are to do with, with water. And I'm really interested to move on to water management rather than just water quality. But um, a transverse analysis, so looking at what we learn from across these cases extending that as far as we can to other EU countries and understanding what are the similarities and differences between what the countries are, are doing. Why is the uptake in some countries and not others? What are the factors determining that? The geography is clearly one. Um, we were discussing yesterday in the Netherlands, the, uh, the lakes are, uh, are much shallower, so they get warmer, but turbidity is more of a problem. High intensity agriculture means there's a lot of um, a lot of runoff, a lot of uh, issues to be dealt with. Um, the governance structures in the countries, the legislation, the cultural factors, and of course the socio-economic factors. What uh, what are they used to? So we're currently working on on that. And um, if you have any uh, further questions, please uh, don't hesitate to get in contact with me. Um, findings are available on the website. And um, if you have uh, cases, we're very interested to, to hear about and to discuss this uh, further with, uh, with people if they're, if they're interested. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much. As I said, I highly recommend this also. It's a very nice way to yeah, wrap up uh, the projects and the benefits of the Earth Observation. Um, yeah, so I think we are now coming to an end. There's one question from the audience from Cedric Hivar. To Megan, maybe you can interact uh, via email. Um, so, yeah. Or do you want to say something real quick, Megan, if you are still here? He uh, stepped out. Ah, she stepped out. Okay. So then, thanks again. So we have seen different kind of applications, like large-scale cyanobacteria monitoring or small-scale seagrass mapping in the U.S., uh, supporting regulation monitoring, uh, nice web applications, and also um, how the satellite data is served for disaster risk reductions um, in the Mekong Basin. So this really underpins the benefits of what EO can bring um, and from a very objective and transboundary point of view. We also discussed the obstacles to fully explore and make use of the benefits, um, but we all know that in combination also with different uh, data sources like modeling and environmental knowledge can be really supportive in delivering the valuable insights. So uh, I want to close here the thematic session. I will pass over to Erin if she wants to say some final words about upcoming events. So thank you all for your attendance from my side. Yes. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, I won't keep you much longer. Again, I just want to say thanks to all the speakers. Karen, thank you for your moderation and for all the attendees and your questions and uh, just joining the session. We really appreciate it. We hope to see you engage with the community of practice some more in the future. So once again, thanks for joining and please do continue to enjoy your days and your week. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank you, Have a bye. nice day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank bye. You. bye. bye.